Good morning. It's Tuesday, March 17th, 2015. I'm Raquel Harris. And I'm Ashley Smith. Thank you for joining us this St. Patrick's Day on Newsbeat. An elderly man is dead after a deadly blaze in a high-rise located in the 300 block of South Damon. Fire crews rushed to West Point Plaza after getting a 911 call for help. A 70-year-old man is dead after a high-rise fire broke out on the near west side. The man was found on the 11th floor of the West Point Plaza building, where he was later transported in critical condition to Stroger Hospital and was later pronounced dead. The fire was contained to his one unit and no one else was injured. Uh, we continued with a systematic search of the 11th floor and all the associated floors up above, uh, continued a floor to uh, or top to bottom search of each stairway and uh, gave final searches and uh, found no additional victims at that time. In order to keep high-rise buildings like this safe, buildings must include enclosing stairwells and self-closing fire-rated doors. Here are some fire safety tips for people who live or work in high-rise buildings. One, check out and get familiar with the building emergency evacuation plans, usually found posted on walls in the hallways. Two, be able to recognize the fire and emergency alarms, which can be buzzers or flashing lights. Three, report any blocked exits, damaged or broken fire safety systems, and follow up until the problem is fixed. There are other steps that people who live in high-rise buildings can take to prevent fires. For example, something as simple as owning an automatic shutoff iron. I can't tell you how many times I've forgotten to turn off the iron or unplug it. And so I really depend on that feature. The cause of the fire is still unknown. However, fire crews have returned to the high-rise building located on the city's west side to reassure the residents are now safe. Fire officials say the man used an oxygen tank, which may have been the cause of the fire, but the, investi the investigation still continues. Two men are dead and another injured in a shooting outside of a Bucktown nightclub. It happened at the Dolphin of the city's northwest side. Police say it all started inside, but quickly spilled out into the street. 41-year-old Elijah Moore, a father of three, was fatally shot in the chest. A man was killed and a third injured. 32nd Ward Alderman Scott Wagaspak says he spent the past four years trying to close the club. Wagaspak says the Dolphin has a history of violence. There is no suspect in custody. A Missouri man is being held on bond this morning for shooting two police officers in Ferguson. He says he wasn't trying to shoot the officers, but rather someone he was arguing with. 20-year-old Jeffrey Williams is now facing multiple charges, including two counts of first-degree assault. Officials say Williams admitted to firing the shots, but wasn't aiming at the officers. Williams told police that he was targeting someone he had a dispute with. There was a weapon recovered, uh, which, uh, which has... Uh, been, been tied to the uh, shell casings that were recovered there, the weapon recovered from him, um, and he has acknowledged his participation in firing the shots. The two wounded officers were treated and released for their injuries. William is now being held on a $300,000 bond. A former University of Chicago student is on the loose after allegedly stabbing his roommate multiple times and severely injuring him. Police are looking for the man who committed the attack in the Hyde Park neighborhood. The man in question, Ross Jacobs, is believed to have ran from the scene on Friday. Police say Jacobs could be armed and dangerous, and they encourage anyone with information to call 911. A woman is shot while riding a taxi in Wicker Park. Authorities say it happened near the 1200 block of North Damon Avenue when someone fired shots from an alleyway. Police rushed to the scene and pulled into the car into a nearby gas station. The 35-year-old woman was struck in the arm and taken to a nearby hospital. Police say it's clear that the woman was not intend the intended target. So far, there have been no arrests. In typical Chicago fashion, it can, be, it can be spring and winter the next. The last 24 hours has been real weather roller has been a real weather roller coaster. Newsbeat's Liz Delu is here with more. Liz. Yeah, guys, Chicago hit 70 degrees yesterday. Hopefully you got out there and enjoyed that early taste of spring because unfortunately today we won't be hitting those high tents. Not by a long shot. Let's take a look. Today we'll hit 45 for the high and 33 for the low, but on that's 
pretty average for this time of year as the average high is 47 and the average low is 31. But the record high was 80 degrees in 2012 and zero degrees in 1941. And I'll be back later for your full five day forecast. Back to you guys. Thanks, Liz. The Columbia College budget will see major cuts this fall, and that includes student jobs and, in some cases, entire department. Faculty and staff received an email from school officials informing them about the budget. The province cites financial troubles for the cuts. The announcement by the college comes shortly after the city council and mayor voted to raise the minimum wage in Chicago. Currently, the college employs more than 1,000 student workers at the rate of $8.75 an hour. The new city ordinance calls for the annual increase over a five-year period. They say that will offset the rise in living costs. The wage hike is expected to reach $13 by 2019. SEIU endorsement Jesus Chuy Garcia is giving Mayor Rahm Emanuel a run for his money after getting a job major endorsement that could have removed Emanuel as mayor. Service Employees International Union State Council endorsed Garcia in the runoff. Election day is on April 7th. The endorsement will come with about $2 million in campaign contributions. Emmanuel has raised $15 million compared to Garcia's $1.2. But that gap is closing with the help of SEIU funds. Bagpipes in Emerald Green, St. Patrick's Day wouldn't be complete without its annual parade. Newsbeat reporter Crystal Brown attended this year's parade and got a glimpse of all things Irish. Thanks, ladies. Chicagoans were certainly in great spirits as they dressed in their traditional greens to celebrate the Irish holiday. The 60th annual St. Patrick's Day celebration began with the dying of the Chicago River. Then it continued on to the parade on Columbus and Balboa. The St. Patty's Day celebration kicked off this weekend as spectators lined the streets to see the parade. Traditional Irish dancers wore their signature curly updos as they wowed the crowd with their unified dance routines. High school bands filled the parade route with upbeat music, while the steady beat of the drums kept the crowd moving and engaged. Chicago is looking a lot more green this weekend. The St. Patrick's Day parade brought out food, floats, and tons of Chicagoans. Thousands attended the parade, making this year one of the biggest turnouts. There was never a dull moment as the parade provided a huge number of floats. And the parade wouldn't be complete without a steady stream of politicians. There is a runoff election April 7, so the candidates hope to take advantage of the crowd. One Chicagoan has yet to miss a St. Patty's Day parade. I come every single year, yes. While others attended to celebrate their Irish roots. Just in the spirit, it's a nice place to be during this time. Well, Irish, so thought why not? What's better than come here? I had a great time. The St. Patrick's Day Parade is definitely a fun, family-friendly event that continues to get better each year. So, you know, I, I can see how excited people were. Like, how, how was it for you? The atmosphere was great. Everyone was happy. Everyone was dressed in their green. It was just great. And the kids loved it. It was just a wonderful time all together. Well, happy St. Patrick's Day, ladies. <laughs> yeah, all right, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. Later today, see why an American millionaire was arrested in a New Orleans hotel room. A member from the influential New York real estate family is now behind bars. Robert Durst is being charged with murder. And this isn't the first time he's had a run-in with the law. We've got all the details and more coming up next. A character from the HBO series The Jinx has been arrested in connection to the multiple murders. Liz Delu has the details. Liz? The hell did I do? Kill them all, of course. Explosive words by Robert Durst, who is the son of one of the most powerful real estate tycoons in New York City, and also a cold case murder suspect. The 71-year-old caught making an apparent confession to himself in a bathroom while still having his mic on after an interview has been the focus of HBO's documentary series, The Jinx. The six-part series investigates whether Durst was involved in the disappearance of his wife, Kathy Durst, in 1982, as well as the unsolved murder of his friend and crime author, 
Susan Berman, who was shot to death 15 years ago in her Beverly Hills home. The series explores the possibility that Berman was murdered because of the fact that she knew what happened to Kathy. In the final episode, the filmmakers confront Durst with a letter he wrote to Berman while she was still alive. They compare Burst's handwriting and the misspelling of her address with a letter written to police telling them the location of Berman's body. Durst denies he wrote it. Well, what I see as the similarity is really the, the misspelling in the Beverly. Other than that, the, the block letters are block letters. The Los Angeles County District Attorney recently reopened the Berman case. Durst was arrested at a New Orleans hotel Saturday. He's being held on a capital murder charge in Berman's death, citing additional evidence that has come to light in the past year. Durst is no stranger to controversy. In 2003, he was charged for the murder and dismemberment of his Texas neighbor. Durst said he acted in self-defense, and a jury acquitted him. It is unclear if the HBO documentary has any role in the recent arrest of Durst. Chip Lewis, Durst's attorney, told Fox News that he is underwhelmed by the new developments revealed in the series. The county's got a case. We'll, we'll address those facts in the courtroom, but, but generally speaking, I, I was underwhelmed. Police arrested Durst in his New Orleans hotel room on Saturday. Durst paid for, the, paid for his room in cash under a false name and had a false driver's license. They believe he was preparing to flee the country. If convicted, he could face the death penalty. The mystery is over today in Russia, though not exactly solved. Russian President Vladimir Putin is back. The question is, was he really missing? The president had not been seen for about 11 days. This comes after much speculation that the leader was sick. He did not explain where he went, but he did laugh at the rumors about him leaving the country to attend the birth of his love child. Still ahead on Newsbeat, one of the world's biggest entertainers is spearheading a band against one of the fashion industry's most iconic design duos. Hear what controversial statements is shaking up the fashion world next. It was an explosive time in Hollywood this past weekend. Raquel Harris is here with the tea on all the latest star study gossip. Raquel? Thanks, Ashley. From three icons having a hashtag battle to a bold beauty making history. We've got all of that and more in today's cup of the tea. Brand new fin final. Singer and songwriter Elton John and world-renowned fashion duo Dolce & Gabbana are going head-to-head -head after the designer shared some less-than-sensitive words about gay couples having children. During an interview with an Italian magazine, the fashion icon said children of in vitro fertilization are, quote, synthetic. Elton John fired back via Instagram calling Dolce & Gabbana's words archaic and out of the step with times, just like their fashion. In fact, Elton John launched an a social media boycott with the hashtag, hashtag Boycott Dolce & Gabbana. The fashion house is now saying its statements were not meant to hurt anyone and only intended to express their personal beliefs freely. She's just a 14-year-old transgender teen. Jazz Jennings is the new face of Clean & Clear. The company's new ad campaign, See the Real Me, promotes natural beauty. Jennings is a well-known activist for the transgender community and says she struggled with her identity growing up. Using her heartfelt story, Jennings hopes to impact the young girls around the world by showing them the real her. The campaign asks people to use the hashtag SeeTheRealMe when posting on social media. Fashionable and some might say rebellious, and now Rihanna is making history. The pop singer is the new face of Dior. This is the first time a black woman has ever represented the iconic fashion brand. It's not hard to believe that the red carpet diva was selected. The four-time five, four or five-second singer is set to appear in the fourth episode of Dior's Secret Garden video series this spring. And that's all I have for you. You just got the latest in entertainment news. I'll see you next time. Chicago has got a glimpse of, glimpse of spring yesterday. 70 degrees with a whole lot of sunshine. Liz, is Chicago teasing us with yesterday's warmth, or is it here to stay? Well, guys, we've officially survived winter, although it's not technically winter, or not technically spring yet. We won't be seeing any more of those brutal negative temperatures. Let's go ahead and take a look outside. It's not quite 70 degrees like yesterday, but the sun is still shining, so we have that to look forward to today. So your weekend travel plans, you might be going somewhere for spring break as it's that time of year, and good... <laughs> 
there's good news because you will probably get out of the airport just fine as there are no delays. And so, let's take a look at our five day forecast. We have pretty much all sun this week, so that is great going into the weekend. Our highest temperature will be Friday with 54 degrees and Saturday for 45 degrees. So guys, what did you do yesterday for the 70 degrees of sun? I had sun? three classes actually. Did. I did, so I didn't get to enjoy it at all. Ugh. Yeah. I grilled some burgers. I should have took a trip great. to the beach, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, thank you so much, Liz. Thanks, You're Liz. Welcome. Coming up, Natalie Cardona will bring you reaction from this weekend's action packed Big Ten tournament. How the Badgers walked away with the championship. Plus, with Mar March Madness finally arriving, Newsbeat's Eddie Diaz will be talking favorites, upsets, and more coming up on Newsbeat. One of the biggest sports days of the year is finally here. All eyes will be on March Madness 2015. The games start tonight. Newsbeat's Natalie Cardona is live in the newsroom with more on Chicago's role in the madness. Natalie? Let the March Madness begin. 68 men's college basketball teams are vying for a spot in the national championship. Half of those were selected based on their worthiness, the other half based on winning their conference championships, and some of those winners passed right through the United Center. <laughs> Michigan State fans and Wisconsin fans flocked to the United Center for the Big Ten Tournament Championship this past weekend. Chicago's Daily Plaza was even decked out for the out-of-towners. Indiana, Ohio, and Maryland were some of the teams that passed through the UC doors, but no Illinois teams are able to break their way far into the NCAA tournament. Well, we were down visiting for the weekend and we decided to come to the game. The Badgers made it to the championship, stuck one out against Purdue, and now we're here. So. On any other day, the United Center is home to both the Blackhawks and the Bulls. But this past weekend, the United Center saw, for the first time ever, 14 teams for the Big Ten tournament in a five-day series. This won't happen again until 2019. The crowds to buy tickets were light. This is the first year the Big Ten tournament didn't sell out after back-to-back -back years of solid pre-sales. This is a bit of a setback for tourism in the city and is unusual considering the high volume of Big Ten alumni in Chicago. Nonetheless, March Madness excitement pushed on as Wisconsin snatched the Big Ten championship title in overtime against Michigan State. I thought the game was a lot of fun being a not really caring side. Looking forward to the tournament now. I'm going to fill up my bracket as soon as I get back home. Probably going to have Wisconsin going pretty far. And yeah, I thought it was all around a great game. If you haven't filled out a bracket yet, you can find one right on NCAA.com or download the March Madness app right on your phone. The game tonight will be Manhattan versus, Ham versus Hampton, and that's at 540 tonight. And that's about it. I'm Natalie Cardona. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Natalie. Win or lose, there's never a dull moment in Chicago sports. Eddie Diaz is here to bring everyone up to speed after a busy weekend in sports. Hey, Thank Eddie. You ladies. How's it going? Lots to get into, sports fans, so we're going to jump right into it. The injury-riddled Bulls rolled into Oklahoma City looking to defeat the Thunder after having lost four of their last five games. But Russell Westbrook and company would be no easy task. We'll pick it up late second quarter. Westbrook, hand down, man down, buzzer beater three, ties the game at 47. Late third quarter, Tony Snell drives that lane and throws down a ferocious jam to put the Bulls within two. Late fourth quarter, Miritich takes the three, makes the three. He's going to tie the game at 89 here. But Westbrook would prove to be too much for the Bulls to overcome. The steal, the drive, the lay in the game. The Thunder would go on to defeat the Bulls 109 to 100. And those red hot Blackhawks travel to San Jose to take on the Sharks. Pick it up early in the first. Sharp's shot is rejected by Niemi, but Sharp gets his own rebound and puts the Hawks up 1-0. Early third period, Saad gets the breakaway, beats Niemi with a beautiful deke. Late in the third, Hawks up two. Taze fires that dagger shot into the back of the net. Hawks would go on to win a blowout 6-2. They've now won four of their last five and continue to chase first place in the Central Division. 
There is a feeling that takes over sports fans, especially college basketball fans, this time of the year that can only be described as one thing, madness. That's right, sports fans, March Madness is upon us once again, and number one seed Kentucky is the clear-cut favorite to win it all. After finishing their regular season a perfect 34-0, the Wildcats will look to win six more games and become the first team to go a perfect 40-0 since the Indiana Hoosiers in 1976. In the past 10 years, the number one ranked team has won the tournament just twice, but the Wildcats seem determined to become that third team. Real quick. Uh, the Bears made some quiet free agency moves this weekend, signing wide receiver Eddie Royal and safety Antrell Roll to matching three-year deals. Northwestern's women's basketball team made the Women's March Madness Tournament as the number seven seed, and it may soon be time to reset those watches to Tebow time, as the quarterback sensation Tim Tebow worked out for the Philadelphia Eagles on Monday and could be offered a contract in the coming days. Lots going on in the sports world, ladies. You guys filling out a March Madness bracket this weekend? I, you know, I'm not a sports fan, Eddie. I'm, I hate to tell you, but... That's, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's not my thing either. How about you, Liz? Nope. Oh, for three, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Well, thanks, ladies. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Eddie. Anytime you want us to watch a game, we'll be there. <laughs> well, that's all we have for the news today. I'm Ashley Smith. And I'm Raquel Harris. Thanks for tuning in to Newsbeat. Enjoy your day, and we'll see you next time.